what's going on everybody this is josh i'm here with uh three sport podcast today i have a guest here my friend austin from work how's it going austin not too bad not too bad looking like i'm ready to talk about some week 11 football here today we got ourselves a little layout here so we're looking at what we got to talk about uh let's let's have you started off here with the the top of the list here your favorite topic of the week Oh, the crushing, devastating Sunday afternoon loss that the Packers had at the hands of the Indianapolis Colts. There's a lot to be said about that game on Sunday. Um, Special teams did not look good. Derry Shepard did not look good returning the ball. Uh, MVS fumbling uh, right at the beginning of the overtime but he did have that 47-yard catch to set up the field goal to send it into overtime. The defense getting shredded again uh, this week by Jonathan Taylor, who found himself, you know, back in the rotation after losing snap count the past how many weeks. The secondary looks like they were playing a little bit of a conservative-style defense, a lot of... Uh, gaps for That's the a receivers. Nice way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> just a, not a lot of good things except for you know. It, I think you know I'm a big Aaron Rodgers fan. Uh, I didn't think he looked too terrible on no, Sunday. Definitely not. He had a couple you know iffy passes. Um, there was some iffy calls. Uh, in my opinion, that fourth down and one when you could have tied the game. Yeah, he said you. Do a play action and toss it five yards over Jamal Williams' head. But pretty good day to be a ref, though. You got paid a lot. <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of holding penalties. Did they say eleven holding penalties? Yeah, it was like nine eight on one drive. Essentially, that Colts drive it was like yeah. They said six nine, or seven, nine against the Colts. That not it, with those holding penalties. Not a lot of them looked like holding. No, but yeah, nothing you can do. The big thing to take away also from the game, is the Packers' running game has not been there. Yeah, it feels like it kind of diminished against the Colts. Well, even like I was just telling you before we went on here, the Packers' running backs have only managed to rush over 80 yards once this year. That's all the running backs. And the only running back to do that was Aaron Jones, and that was all the way back in week two. Yeah. When he went for, what, 168? Mm Mm-hmm. Against the Detroit Lions. I mean, that's... We got to somehow get the running backs more involved. I know Aaron Jones was out with the injury. Um, Jamal Williams, you know, he was out with the COVID. Or he was on the COVID and AJ Dillon, uh, yeah. protocol. A.J. Dillon was out with the COVID. Who's was still out, too. But we just have to find a way to somehow get these running backs involved a little bit more, um, especially with the big matchup on Sunday against a very good Chicago defense. When when you look at the numbers from the Packers Colts game, when you've got your second leading rushers Aaron Rodgers on less carries than Jamal Williams, Jamal Williams is a good back, and for him to have less rushing yards than Aaron Aaron Rodgers, that's that's a bit of a worrisome sign for at least the week in being. And I understand like you can blame a little bit of that on. Um, Corey Lindsley getting injured yeah. and having to move Jenkins over yep. to center. But, I mean, there's still a good offensive line that can, you know, open up holes. Aaron Jones is a good running back who can find his time before he explodes out. But it, it doesn't seem like they're getting the carries right now. And I need. think the biggest thing when it comes to the Colts game, um, for as much hate as he got, I think the one thing that we should definitely look at is uh, Marquez Valdez Scanling's performance. When you look at the stats from the game – um, the stats don't lie. I mean, he had six targets and he only managed to catch three of them. One of them, three catches, I think was like a 40 something yard. That was catch. That, yeah. That was a 47 yard yeah. uh, on that third down and 10 right at the end. So for having drive. 55 yards and on three catches on six targets, I mean, if you look at all the other receivers on the team, I think only, so Lazard dropped two or missed two. Jamal missed one. Devante missed one. Other than that, everyone was a hundred percent. EQ had a 23-yard catch. Sternberger was 3-for-3. Three three. Um, you know, Mercedes was obviously, and then Tanyan was 5-for-5 five five with a touchdown. Well, the thing with Scantling is the 
catch to target ratio is under or the percentage is under 50% again for the second year in a row right now. This being his third year in the league. Last year, you know, he caught 26 passes out of the 56 that were targeted to him. This year he's at 25 of 51. I mean, not that far away from the 50%, but when you have <clears throat> you're considering that right now as your number 2 guy, that's just not cutting it and i think another big thing to look at too is if you look at the defense a lot of people were talking about how the packers really struggled with tackling um you had raven green on the top with seven kirksey with six and five assisted tackles i mean it looks like your linebackers and well kenny clark on the only on the defensive line essentially are doing the biggest amount of work you got one tackle from lowry and one from lancaster it's like your defensive line is just not really doing as much tackling as it should for the run game, essentially. The run game was crazy for the Colts. Naheem Hines and Jonathan Taylor were really finding their way through. For a guy that fumbles as much as Jonathan Taylor does, he didn't fumble once, and he had 90 yards on 22 carries. It's like that. Well, this, like The big thing is, especially with when you brought up the fact of Tyler Lancaster and Dean Lowry, they seem non-existent during the games. They seem like they're getting bullied the entire game. I I love um, Kenny Clark, but just something with that defensive front that they're not getting any push, and they're just getting gashed time and time. And we've seen it all year long. We've seen it last year, especially against the San Francisco 49ers. Yep. It, there needs to be something done with the way that the defensive line has the surge and the way that the linebackers fill the holes. And I think it's interesting, too, to point out that um, the the Packers did stop Naheem Hines. That was, I think, that was probably the, everyone's biggest worry going into this game was that they that they would be able to stop Naheem Hines. Uh, on six carries, he got two yards and no, not a single touchdown. And receptions-wise, which is where he's been lethal all year, he had 31 uh, yards, no touchdown. But he did catch three of his four targets. But I think the fact that they were unable to let him score is actually probably one of the hugest um, things for them. Like you said, yeah, we did manage to stop Naheem Hines, but when you know Jonathan Taylor finally came back into the rotation this week, knowing you know Frank Reich probably knew he was going to need to rely on Jonathan Taylor this week against the um, Packers' run defense, and he did that. I mean, the 37 carries for the entire total Colts team for 140 yards. I mean, they really took the – They really held Green Bay in defense, like in check. They had the ball for over thirty-five minutes that entire game, compared to Green Bay's twenty-seven. But and the the biggest thing to take away is the one hundred and forty rushing yards for Indy. It's only sixty-eight total rushing yards yeah. for Green Bay. Green Bay's rushing performance was, I'd say, rather lackluster that game as compared to what it should have been. And there's so they have on this NFL app. They have some like little insights here. Um. So I didn't know this, but apparently Michael Pittman is actually the sixth rookie since 1970 from on the Colts with 50 plus receiving yards in three straight games. So if you think two straight games this rookie's got 50 plus receiving yards, uh, you'd think to try and like you know have someone like guarding him, like yep. focus on him. Yep. I feel like teams are putting a lot, a lot like way too much focus on T.Y. Hilton this year, and T.Y. Hilton has done nothing. Um, T.Y. Hilton has been very lackluster. Yep. And, like, he had 36 catches. He had six targets, and he only caught three passes. But Michael Pittman had three targets, caught all three of them, had 66 yards and a touchdown. He's been, honestly, he's been he's been pretty good. And he's quick, too. So I just think they should have probably put a little bit more, like, thought into that. Yeah, I agree with that. But um, enough about the Packers. <laughs> Let's get over to uh, to my... <laughs> to my absolutely most interesting topic that I'd like to discuss so far. Uh, so for most of you guys, you know I'm a Dolphins fan. Uh, unfortunately, I have to live that life. But um, hey, you guys are in second place. You know, yeah, we were six and three. It was really good. Looked really good. Beat Arizona. But um, let me just, I, I gotta just talk about the elephant in the room here with the Dolphins, and that's uh, Tua getting benched for uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. I I didn't like the move initially. Until I saw that Tua got sacked six times. Um, Tua won 11 for 20 with 83 yards and a touchdown. Um, so, not the greatest passing performance. However, Ryan Fitzpatrick, this dude comes in off the bench after not playing for, like, what was it, four weeks, three weeks? 
goes 12 for 18, 117 yards, no touchdowns, and interception. Um, Ryan Fitzpatrick, honestly, he if he would have, I think the main thing with that end of that game there when he threw that pick, if he would have not thrown it to Devontae Parker, because the, everyone knows Devontae Parker is the number one guy in the Dolphins. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dude had nine targets. Um, if he would not have thrown it to Parker, if he would have thrown it to literally anyone, or if they would have even tried to run the ball, um, they could have they could have probably got something there. But he tried to force it into Devontae Parker on the goal line, and it was just it was a triple coverage situation, double coverage, whatever it was, and it just it didn't didn't work out the way he wanted it to. And I think that being a little bit careless of the ball is going to hurt you. And um, I don't know, maybe Ryan Fitzpatrick just thought like, hey, this is Devontae Parker. This is my guy. This is who I linked up with so many times when uh, when I was playing. He thought that it would be a catch, but I don't know. It's just it's kind of unfortunate that that's the way the game had to end. It was rather heartbreaking, if I'm being honest. But um, against a team like Denver, who coming into that game was 3-6, uh, and six, um, definitely they should not have won. But, you know, it's one of those situations where it's like that's just – you play like that and you play it. but hey the defense though the defense is still looking pretty pretty it's amazing really defense. uh Andrew Van Ginkle after giving up uh really really I don't know what happened if I remember correctly I don't know if he missed a tackle or something or missed a sack or did something he did something stupid uh or he had a bad penalty he came back from that and he forced a fumble basically I think it was on the goal line uh Melvin Gordon was carrying the ball in and he popped it out and Eric Rowe picked it up and then uh sometime in the game here Xavier Howard had a 10-yard interception, which absolutely helped them a lot. But when you get these defensive plays and you get back on offense, this offensive momentum should lead you – or the defensive momentum should lead you to have scoring opportunities on offense. And when you're carrying the ball 12 times and only getting 43 yards with uh, Ahmed and barely running the ball with Matt Breida, it's like Matt Breida played for the 49ers last year, and this dude was elite. (laughs) That was going to be my question, like – the way that Matt Breida played last year, you guys have s- seldomly used him this year. You know, it doesn't make sense. I don't understand what Brian Flores is doing with the running backs because it was like with Jordan Howard. Jordan Howard has never been bad, but he's never been elite. But Jordan Howard is still the leading running back for the Dolphins, and he's not even on the team. Like, he has the most touchdowns for the team. He has four, I think. And it's because Jordan Howard would come in and carry the ball in the goal line, and he'd get in the end zone. Well... Matt Breida is a fast running back, so I don't know why Matt Breida doesn't come in like earlier on and just like run the ball downfield. Right, it's weird. What do you think Miami needs to do to unplant Buffalo as the number one team in the East? Well, they gotta just hope Buffalo loses. Um, Buffalo needs to lose. That's hundred uh, percent certain. But um, I think they need to figure out. They need to figure out uh, is two of their guy or not. If you know, if they. If they're going to take two out late in the game, put in Ryan Fitzpatrick, um, you got to keep Ryan Fitzpatrick playing because at this point it's almost just a sense of false hope if Ryan Fitzpatrick was going to lead that team back but then lose. It's like, okay, so he led the team back and he got them to a spot where they could win, but then he threw that pick and they ended up ultimately losing. So it's like, do you still trust Ryan Fitzpatrick or are you going to trust Tua? By the way, Tua hasn't thrown a single pick since he's been playing yet either. We'll get to see a good amount of Tua, I think, next week against the Jets. I mean, they got yeah. two. They got two games here that they should win back to back. Obviously, like I said, against the Jets, but then they get the Cincinnati Bengals right after that yep, with Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow. Being out. Yep. But then they get a hard stretch. Then they go against the Chiefs. Yep, that's the Patriots, tough. the Raiders, and well, then the Patriots they end the season against concerned. Buffalo. The Patriots are not too concerned about because the Patriots have been kind of lackluster, and with the Dolphins' defense, I think they're going to get all over Cam Newton. I think that's going to be a rather interesting game. I mean, it'll be a big game. They did lose it on Week One. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then do you think it's going to come down to that final game against Buffalo? I think it will. Yeah, I, I really do. It, it depends. It's um, If Buffalo wins out, if they keep winning, then yeah. But if Buffalo does, like, if Buffalo loses, or no, if, 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 yeah, if Buffalo loses, I really think that uh, the Dolphins can just, like, not, like, free roam, but they can they can carry on without having to play as hard and like as like like hey we got to take two out because he gets sacked six times and put in Fitzpatrick like that kind of irrational thing so well it's not like Buffalo has a very easy schedule down the road they play no. one of my favorite rookies this year uh Justin Herbert and the Chargers uh next week 
and they followed up with San Francisco, and then they uh, play Sunday night football against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yep, that's so going to be a good game to test uh, test Josh Allen there against that top defense. Okay, so I just now watched. I got. To, I'm watching the uh, NFL highlights thing, and it's showing the uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick interception again. So, uh, to break it down for you guys, uh, if you didn't see it, it was third and eight. Uh, they're on. Uh, I'd say roughly about the 15 yard line, and uh, so they they were running three wide, actually four wide, and uh, guy in the backfield, Ahmed, and um. Blocking was fine. Um, if honestly, if Fitzpatrick wanted to, he could tuck and run and run up front, uh, out to the right, and he would have probably been able to stretch for a first down. But uh, I think he rushed his throw, and he, of course, he had to throw it to the one guy on the the Denver Broncos defense that's like an elite defender in Justin Simmons. So you know, it's just kind of what happened, and it got picked off, and they were able to win the game off of that. What yard line were they on in that one again? The fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I I don't know. The Dolphins are not really the most important thing. I think something that's really important that I think we definitely need to talk about is uh, this 10-0 Pittsburgh Steelers team. Oh, yes. Um, coming into the game Thursday this week, tomorrow – no, not tomorrow, Thursday this week, um, the Ravens are without two of their best running backs, uh, J.K. Dobbins and Mark Ingram, both out due to COVID. Um, now, is that going to – mean possibly someone on the offensive line can be out because of COVID because there could still be more due to contract contact tracing. Right. And with not having five days again in between to test negative, um, they have no shot at playing. So if any of them offensive linemen are down, it's going to be tough for Lamar Jackson against that Steelers defense. Is this a win must win game for Baltimore? I would, I would say, I mean, Either it's either must win or it's must win for bragging rights because you know you're going up against an undefeated team and it's a big rivalry Pittsburgh and Baltimore so it's they played an amazing game a few weeks ago Pittsburgh um, pulling it out twenty eight twenty four I'm just looking at the stats here quick so that game J.K. Dobbins had a really good game fifteen carries one hundred and thirteen yards didn't score a touchdown um, Gus Edwards sixteen carries eighty seven and a touchdown and Lamar Jackson went sixteen for sixty five so they ran the ball a yeah. lot that game uh, they weren't really allowed they weren't really able to throw the ball uh, Lamar Jackson only went thirteen to twenty eight two touchdowns two picks <clears throat> I just think the Steelers defense is one of the best defenses they have honestly oh, my favorite defensive player in uh, T J Watt yep. Um, this the the only thing that can stop this Steelers team is if something happens to Big Ben. You know that's that's exactly it. Um, you know, and th- this is a bad example, but just from me playing Madden, I realized that if Big Ben goes down, they're left with Mason Rudolph and Josh Dobbs. Um, that's not good. Like Mason Rudolph, uh, he really showed us how unworthy he is to be a starting quarterback last year, and Josh Dobbs. Um, Josh Dobbs is better suited as a backup. Let's just go with that. Like, you even got to think. You got to remember last year this team went eight and eight and were one seed away from making the playoffs without Big Ben. And they used yeah. Mason Rudolph and who was the other quarterback? Devlin Hodges. Devlin Hodges. That's yep. right. <clears throat> now the biggest thing to take away, I think, from this Pittsburgh Steelers team is the way that Chase Claypool has emerged as one of the top targets for Big Ben. Oh, yeah. Which is crazy because it's like Big Ben, his mantra every year is, okay, we have an all-star, like, amazing receiver on our team. Let's throw it to someone else. Like, he he is really good at making a breakout wide receiver. Yep. Having Antonio Brown on the team, making Juju the breakout wide receiver, Juju being the breakout wide receiver, then him making Chase Claypool a break. Or even Deontay Johnson is starting to step into a big role. Deontay Johnson had a big game last last week. 12 catches for 111 yards. I mean, the thing with Chase Claypool, though, compared to Deontay Johnson, I, I feel like he's a little bit more versatile because he gets used on like end arounds and stuff. Yep. So he runs the ball and gets thrown the ball. So it's like, it's really, it's hit or miss with that guy. Well, you got to think. So. Chase Claypool has 10 total touchdowns this year, eight of them coming from receiving, two of them coming from uh, the ground. Now, he's, in terms of 
catches on the team. He doesn't rank anywhere near as high as Deontay Johnson or Juju Smith, but he's got that impact in the red zone. Right. He's a big body. He's, what, 6'4"? 6'4", yeah. Perfect guy for Big Ben to throw the ball up to and hope he comes down with the ball. And he... This is just another target that Juju Smith will have that the defenses are going to have to focus on. Because mm-hmm. I, me myself, you haven't really seen since Antonio Brown left. Juju Smith hasn't shined the way I think that people have expected. No, definitely not. But you got to realize he had Antonio Brown on the other side, taking away a lot of the um, coverage away from him. Yeah, but. I know Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool, if they continue to do what they're doing, I feel like Juju is going to be back to where he was a couple of years ago. Well, and so here's a big thing that I'm I'm looking at right now. So, uh, they played the Titans uh, week six or week seven. It was this year. Uh, they won by three points. Yep. Um, in this game, Big Ben threw three picks, and Chase Claypool was not utilized at all. And um. Chase Chase Claypool and James Conner both actually fumbled in this game. Uh, however, the biggest part of it, like they didn't have any n- no interceptions, they had no fumbles. Um, like their kicker kicked two field goals and made all three of his extra points. So you got nine or twenty seven points off of your kicker. Um, they ran the ball in once with Benny Snell. Big Ben threw two touchdowns. Deontay Johnson again two touchdowns that game. Huge target. And it's crazy because Big Ben, he throws the ball all around. He throws it to Juju. He throws it to Deontay. Eric Ebron, he throws it to Connor. He throws it to Jalen Samuels if he's out there. Claypool, Washington, you know, he's got all these targets. In this game, he threw he targeted uh, Deontay 15 times and Juju 14. So it's like if you can still throw three picks and still find out a way to win against one of the best defenses in the league, that's pretty impressive. And I'm not going to lie, I was one of the people that – you know, when Big Ben came back this year, that was not very high on him. Um, but he's come out and he's proving yeah. all of us people that think that thought that wrong. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who didn't think Big Ben was gonna who was gonna shine. I thought his arm was gonna be shot like it was like with Peyton Manning in his final year. Like, mm-hmm. but to see this team at ten and zero right now, with a chance to possibly lock up the division here soon against a tough opponent this th- uh, Thursday night against the Ravens. I don't know. I th- I can I think they're going to pull it off and go to 11-0. Yeah, I do too. I really do. Um now granted, okay, so I'm looking back now. Chase Claypool's three t- uh, four touchdown game was against the Eagles. Um the Eagles defense team, actually the Eagles team in general. Um, Not a good team this year. I think we actually have that on our list of topics, so we're gonna actually we're gonna go and we we're just gonna to yeah we're gonna talk about that one. Um, Carson Wentz, the you know, Carson number. Wentz, is he still a valuable starting quarterback in your opinion? What do you think? <sighs> I think it's time to make the change. Yeah, I do too. Um, I don't know if Jalen Hurts is the guy though. I don't know. I just I know Carson Wentz is not the guy. If he struggles to start this game on Monday against that Seattle secondary, I think you have to think about possibly benching him, taking him out of the game, Mm -hmm. and giving the ball to Jalen Hurts. It's, you know, I just, I'm going to look at a little bit of a comparison here. So you got Carson Wentz this season. Um, Carson Wentz, other than his rookie year, he hasn't really been known as much of an interception guy. Um, this year he's thrown as many picks as he threw in his rookie year already. He's thrown the most picks yep. in the NFL this season. He leads that category by three over Kirk Cousins and Drew Locke. Yep. So uh, Carson Wentz definitely been a fumble guy in his career. Uh, nine, four, nine, nine, and six this year. Um, he also has his worst passer rating. He's gotten sacked the most times out of his career. And that's what I was going to say next is he's been sacked the most times in football this year. So, yeah. I mean, that offensive line obviously is in protecting him. I haven't been able to watch a lot of Philadelphia games, so I don't know if that's more on the offensive line or if, you know, he's holding on the ball too long, especially because, really, you know, they don't have a lot of receivers right now. I think he's trying to do too much because he's also got five rushing touchdowns this year, which is the most he's had in the season so far. Um, I think that he is expecting that, um, 
if he has the ball in his hands, that he's the one that should be making any sort of play. Like, if he's he rolls out and, like, well, without Lane Johnson, because I'm pretty sure Lane Johnson's still out. Without Lane Johnson, he rolls out to the right side. He He's going to get rushed right away. He's got to get rid of that ball. Well, I think the biggest thing is Carson Wentz, he got hurt, what, 2017 is when he tore – he tore his ACL, right? I believe so. Yeah. He was the possible favorite to win, favorite to win the MVP that year up until he got hurt. Ever since then, it just seems like he hasn't been the same type of quarterback. Um, I mean, this is. I think it was twenty eighteen actually, because he only played eleven games in twenty eighteen. And then this year, he doesn't even have. He's under the sixty percent completion percentage yep. mark. Pass uh, rating of seventy three point three. I understand they paid Carson Wentz a lot of money. Yeah. Um, because Sad you know, be them. he was the number two overall pick. He he's lived up to it up until basically this year. Yeah, and I, I you can't put the total blame on Carson Wentz. No, I mean Alshon Jeffrey hasn't played. Deshaun Jackson nope. hasn't played much. But the thing is too, like Jalen Rigor and Travis Fulgham are all both very capable wide receivers. I mean, they by any means it's hard to justify that they've been a problem but i don't know another thing that i want to talk about with that too is so they play the browns this week um the browns are a pretty interesting team when it comes to who they've got on their team i'm taking a look right now um one of the people that stands out to me with the browns is kareem hunt yep uh kareem hunt this dude he he's backing up nick chubb and he's performing just as good as a starting running back, essentially. Ninth in the league in terms of total rushing. He's got 644 yards and four touchdowns. He also has uh, 151. All right, so we're back in it. Sorry, the batteries died on this thing. Uh, I've had it for two years. Didn't know the batteries were a thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were talking about Kareem Hunt. Um, yeah, Kareem Hunt, lethal running back and receiving back. I think that he's he's super helpful for the Browns. Um it le- it's helpful for Baker without having Odell for him to not have to rely on the ground rely on, game. Well, and have to throw everything to Jarvis. He can give Kareem some catches, run the ball with Chubb. we got to remember, too, Kareem Hunt is a few years removed from his rookie season when he led the NFL in rushing yards. Yeah. So he is a good running back. No, yep. I wouldn't even say good. He's a great running back. Oh, absolutely. And to have him as – uh, one and two option with Nick Chubb, that is a scary backfield. Yeah, it's just it's unfortunate that his off the field problems made like made him be what he was. But I mean, if you look at his Not stats, too upset. I mean, that Kansas City doesn't need another running back like that. They right, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Kareem Hunt's stats. I mean, rushing, he's only got three total career fumbles, one each season so far, except for his 2018 season, and he's only lost one. Receiving, he has not fumbled the ball once. So, I mean, he's he's good at uh, keeping a hold of the ball. He's reliable for that. Mm. I will say he did get kind of shut down this last Sunday against Philly, though. Yeah, he did. Uh, 13 carries for 11 yards. Um, he should have had two touchdowns. Uh, the one touchdown that got called back was super close to being a touchdown. It was, he was down, like, right before the uh, touchdown line, or right before, right before the end zone. So, it was like... I don't know. I, I was sitting there watching, and I was like, oh, that's a nice touchdown because I have him in fantasy. Uh, nope. Got the one, though. I guess the biggest question with the Cleveland Browns is, are they a playoff team? That's, you know, that's a good question. I mean, they do have a, a pretty easy matchup, in my opinion, this week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, I see them going... 10 and 6, 11 and 5. So I think they will make the playoffs, but the biggest thing comes down to if they fall behind in a playoff game, is Baker Mayfield going to be able to lead this team to a victory? Well, the way I see it is um they they've got people in the hunt right now. Um the Raiders, the Ravens, and the Dolphins are actually in the hunt right behind them right now. Um Honestly, I think that the Browns are on a two-game win streak while all these other three teams have lost. Um, and then Baltimore's lost two, so they're going up against the Steelers this week. Probably going to lose three, not going to lie. Not really thinking they're going to win this game. I really don't. Um, but, you know, anything can happen. It's it's the NFL. 
That is true. Should we stay in that uh, division and talk about what happened on Sunday with uh, number one overall pick, Joe Burrow? Oh, yeah, that's unfortunate. That's uh, So we were watching that game, actually. And um, when I saw the injury happen at first, I was like, oh, he just hyperextended it. He's fine. Honestly, I didn't think anything of it. I really thought that he was going to be good and cool and he was set. And then all of a sudden... People are talking like, "Ooh, that looks bad," and it's like, "What do you, what do you mean?" Like, I'm pretty sure he just hyperextended it. Like the whole time, I'm like, "He hyperextended, it, he hyperextended it." Like I had literally no, uh, no thought that, um, like, uh, Joe Burrow would have been actually hurt. And then uh, we heard a thing that all of a sudden Joe Burrow is out for the season. We're like, "What? Like Joe Burrow? Like it, it's crazy." Does this team win another game this year? Yeah, I think they can. With Ryan Finley at quarterback? Mm-hmm. That backfield is pretty lethal, too. Well, Joe they have Mixon to have Joe Mixon Gio come Bernard. back. Once Joe Mixon comes back, possibly. but And I really like the receiving core that Cincinnati has. I think Tyler Boyd is very underrated. Yeah. As a receiver. Well, they got Tyler Boyd. They have A.J. Green, who caught a touchdown finally. That's a nice round of applause for that one. Um, <laughs> they also got T. Higgins. They have My boy, Auden Alex Tate. Erickson. Alex Erickson. Alex Erickson, who's elusive in any way, shape, or form. And then, I mean, even from a tight end standpoint, who's their tight end again? Um, uh, Drew Sample. Oh, never mind. I thought, they had a, I thought they had a better tight end. Oh, Drew Sample. But, I mean, that receiving core, like, it's pretty crazy. I think if you can get AJ Green more involved, he's been. He's. I mean, I understand he started the season off really slow, um, but these past, I wouldn't even. I guess past couple games, he's he's been relevant. I should say. Yeah. Uh, I know he got um, held without a catch against the Pittsburgh Steelers two weeks ago, um, but like even like against. The Cleveland Browns and the Colts, you know, he almost 82 yards and 96 yards. It's nice to see A.J. Green because he used to be one of the top receivers in the league. Yep. Um, having him come back and being a little himself. You know, and speaking of someone being a little of themselves, not necessarily a comeback, but more of a come up. Let's talk about P.J. Walker, Mr. XFL. Um, how impressive – is it that you can literally come from a XFL league, a league that Vince McMahon, the WWE chairman, owns, and play football, and then come to the NFL, where there's people by the names of Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees and Tom Brady, and be a quarterback, and replace someone like Teddy Bridgewater, who's an established quarterback, and still play, honestly, not horribly. I think P.J. Walker is a... He's, if he had more of an opportunity, I understand Teddy Bridgewater. It was like a late scratch, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. He played well. I mean, he did throw two interceptions, but mm -hmm. he played well. They He led the team to a victory. Yep. He proved that he is a good quarterback. I mean, I understand the XFL is a big step below mm -hmm. the NFL, but he demolished that league. Yeah, he was, he was very, very good. If I can uh, quickly pull up his XFL stats, I'll take a look at that, but... I mean, it's too bad that uh, that PJ Walker had to get outshined by DJ Moore throwing an incomplete pass. <laughs> that's that's just too bad. But so I'm looking at his XFL stats here. Um, so I don't know how many games they played, but um, he so in one of these games he threw 272 yards and four touchdowns, 170 yards and three touchdowns, 306 yards and three touchdowns, 239 yards and two touchdowns. And 351 yards and three touchdowns. He finished uh, the XFL with 15 touchdowns, 1,338 yards, four picks, and a 104.4 passer rating. Easily on his way to winning MVP of that league. Yeah. Wasn't much of a scrambler. He had one rushing touchdown. Uh, most yards he had in the game looked like it was about 30-something. Um, but and He's also doing this with a lot better receiving core. Not to say that those guys in the XFL aren't good at their job. Um, but when you have a guy like DJ Moore, you're throwing the ball to um, Curtis Samuel, Rodney Anderson, or Robbie Anderson. You also have a guy like um, Mike Davis, 
who has done a really good job filling in for uh, Christian McCaffrey in his injuries. But I, the biggest thing to take away from that game is how bad the Detroit Lions were that game. On yeah, offense. That, that Detroit Lions team should not be putting up zero points. I'm sorry, but when you have Matt Stafford, a guy who's seen as elite in a lot of people's eyes as a quarterback, that should not be happening. I think a lot of it comes down to prior in the week, um, Matt Stafford's availability for the game. I think that in – not to say that the injury was – worse than people probably thought but i feel like it did have some effect on the game um but their running attack just didn't do them anything uh averaging 2.4 yards a carry i understand deandre swift was not available for the game but when you're only running the ball seven times with adrian peterson yeah i mean you he's he's he might be a little up there in age but it's still frank gore scored a touchdown (laughs) yeah But it's still Adrian Peterson. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the greatest running backs well, in the NFL has ever seen. And that's like, I uh, I was listening to uh, the McAfee and Hawk show the other day, and AJ Hawk was talking about, this is a old episode I was watching, though, back when AP got cut from the football team. Um, and AJ Hawk said, or because Pat asked me, he's like, so when you guys played AP, what was your instant mindset? You know, being a linebacker, you deal a lot with running backs. And AJ was like, you know, we always were like, this was an important game because AP was a very good running back. And it's like AP always has been this really good running back starting from Minnesota. Granted his time in new Orleans wasn't very good, but even when he was in Washington, he played pretty good. I mean, there was a game that they had against the Packers last year where he, he actually, he played very well. I mean, he's still, he, like I said, he might be up there in age, but he still runs the ball. Like he's one of like a 20 mid 20 year old. Like he, like I understand, let's not. This isn't the MVP level, Adrian Peterson. Right. But, but when you're going up against a guy like Adrian Peterson, he's he's still gonna fight for his yards. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, big bruiser. Another big bruiser, twenty year old rusher. You know who I'm talking about? You got Taysom Hill on the mind here. Let's talk <laughs> about that for a second. Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill, a guy who's been. Can I just say, I loved having him in my fantasy league this week as my tight end. Oh, I'm sure everyone did. Yeah, for those of you who played Taysom Hill as a tight end in your league this week, when Taysom Hill is a tight end and a quarterback, uh, you're welcome. You can thank ESPN because ESPN saved you for a game. If you won with Taysom Hill, if you lost, I should say, with Taysom Hill in your lineup as tight end when he played tight end and quarterback, you just don't have a good team. Yeah. But um, Taysom Hill. So he this dude doesn't Matt have Ryan. a position. I'm convinced that, like, literally you could – He's the jack of all trades. Yeah, he's literally just like, as they would call like Hernan Perez in the MLB. You could call him a utility player. He yeah. plays literally every position. Quarterback, <laughs> like guy, running back, pretty receiver, soon. tight end. He's amazing on special teams. I mean, I'd put the guy in there. Put the guy out on defense yeah. once and let me see what he can do. Honestly, it's um, Taysom Hill, uh, former Packer talent. Uh, never used on the Packers though, but yeah, uh, preseason. <laughs> uh, so, you know. The thing is, we we look at Taysom Hill and uh, we think about you think about it from this perspective. If Drew Brees wasn't old and he wasn't starting to decline a little bit, do you think Taysom Hill would still have gotten an opportunity to shine, or do you think Taysom Hill would have been put in the back burner and just been a backup quarterback? I think personally, Taysom Hill fell into the perfect team for him. Yeah, I understand. Like there probably are some Packer fans that are like, "Oh, we should have kept Taysom Hill." But it's just not the type of offense. Taysom the Hill probably wouldn't be Taysom Hill if he were still on the Packers. No, definitely not. Him going to New Orleans and having Sean Payton coach him, getting the chance to play. I mean, he's a quarterback and he's playing special teams. Yep. He's catching the ball. Yep. He's running the ball. They have specific <laughs> packages for him. This yep. is the perfect team for him. The fact that there's this one guy who's mind you a technically a third string quarterback who the offense or who the coach the head coach has a actual Taysom Hill package set up for for him to line up as a tight end or line up in the backfield or take snaps at quarterback like it's crazy it's it also goes to show you how much they believe in Taysom Hill right because they what did they franchise? Did they franchise tag him this year, or they signed him to? He's he's getting paid. Yeah, really healthy. Getting paid somehow. 
I, and I was very surprised that like when you told me that he was going to be starting over Jameis Winston because even when Drew Brees went out, Jameis Winston was the quarterback that yeah. came in, not Taysom Hill. Jameis Winston was out there eating W's. I don't understand what I, I don't know. Maybe Sean Payton was like, "Hey, dude, enough eating W's. We can't have that out here. We got to have actual W's." Either that or Taysom Hill just showed up and practiced this last the week and yep. came in balled. He he balled because he outshined Matt Ryan. I understand the Falcons aren't the greatest, but they were not terrible after Dan Quinn fired or got fired. But Matt Ryan, I mean, no touchdown passes against the Saints defense. Um, the they didn't use atrocious. they didn't use Julio Jones enough. Two targets for Julio. Well, Jones. Well, Julio did get hurt. I think oh. it was in the fourth quarter though, so he was playing the most of the game. Kelvin Ridley had a great game. Excuse me, Kelvin Ridley had a great game. Gurley had a horrible game. Um. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think the one thing uh, – I think we should transition now over to Thursday, uh, Thursday being Thanksgiving. Um, hopefully everybody has a great Thanksgiving, by the way. Uh, watch some football, eat some ham, eat some turkey, eat chicken, whatever whatever you Enjoy do. Enjoy time with your family. Enjoy time with your family. Do whatever you feel is good for Thanksgiving. Um, but we're going to talk about some football for Thanksgiving. We got three matchups this week. We got Houston against Detroit. Dallas against Washington and Pittsburgh against Baltimore. We've already talked about the Pittsburgh Baltimore ones. We're not going to run that through your minds, but we're just going to say that. Um, well, I'm going to say if Baltimore somehow wins this game, they have bragging rights for the rest of the year. <laughs> if Pittsburgh loses, eh, whatever. It's one loss. You know, you're ten and zero. They're still going to be the number. Or, no, they're they're going to be battling with Kansas City for that uh, first round bye. Yeah. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but um. I will say this though, not very exciting matchups except for the Baltimore no. Pittsburgh game. I mean, this De- year. Detroit Houston, Detroit scored 0 points last week going up against PJ Walker and now they're going up against Deshaun Watson. So, uh odds of them scoring again slim to none. Dallas and Washington, who's playing for Dallas this week? Andy Dalton is he available now? Andy Dalton's still going to be there three touchdowns last week. <laughs> Andy Dalton against Alex Smith. Wow, what kind of matchup world are we living in? <laughs> hey, we're going back in time here. <laughs> this is back when Chiefs Alex Smith against <laughs> Cincinnati Bengals and Andy Dalton clearly. But uh it's a big game though. That 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 game could be for the division. That league. that will be an interesting game honestly. Now that I think about it. If I so I'm going to make predictions on these games. If I had to go, I'd say uh, I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna take Washington over Dallas this week. Um, Alex Smith has really been performing pretty well. Um, unfortunately, the week that he played against the Bengals, they just kind of pulled it out against him. Um, Detroit against Houston. Obviously, I'm gonna pick Houston. Detroit looked awful last week, and Pittsburgh against Baltimore. I'm just gonna have to take Pittsburgh uh, with Dobbins and Ingram out. It's Gus Edwards isn't bad, but it's gonna be a little bit more tough. Oh yeah, and like I said, you my obviously predicted it before i think the steelers are going to win this game yeah if anybody that knows me knows i am not a cowboys fan (laughs) i really despise the cowboys i do apologize cowboys fans but um i do think the cowboys are going to win this week i mean it's 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 thanksgiving oh that is true I feel I think Andy Dalton's gonna come. I feel like Ezekiel Elliott is gonna He's show gonna up eat. like he did last week. He's gonna eat. Yep. Uh and then obviously I have to go with the Houston Texans, yeah. one of my favorite teams. Um they have one of my all time favorite players, JJ Watt. All three of the Watt brothers playing on Thanksgiving. That's gonna be interesting. That'll be fun. <laughs> I cannot wait. Now we're gonna quickly uh for the Last part of this podcast here, uh, we're going to... one thing I want to talk about. Sure, actually. go for it. We're going to go back. We're going to talk about what we talked about earlier in the week. There's a big game on Sunday we forgot to talk about. One of the biggest rivalries in football that I forgot to put on the list. Oh. Green Bay, Chicago. Oh, the coming up game, yeah. We forgot to talk about that game. Oh, yeah. Well, um, Sunday night. It's probably because we kind of figured the outcome already. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. I have a good dear friend of mine that who's even quarterbacking big, for the Bears this week. Is a big Chicago Bears fan. I have a ten dollar bet on this game for uh, Green Bay to win. I will say I am a little scared of Chicago's defense. I mean. Chicago's had a great defense the last how many couple years. It's just that offense. Yeah. It doesn't matter who they've had at quarterback, Mitch Trubisky, Nick Foles, that offense just can't move the ball 
Their running game is atrocious. Um, they have good running backs. They just can't get it done every time. Matt Forte, uh, back when they had uh, Chester Taylor, back when – now they are not back when. Like last year they had Terry Cohen who was running good. Now it's David Montgomery and the Cordero Patterson show, and that's just tough. What I want to I want to talk about this too. So I understand Chicago five and five Bears fans. I mean, probably not happy right now with the you know three losses in a row, or excuse me, four losses in a row. But you got to think this team week one against Detroit lost or won the game from a DeAndre Swift drop in the end zone as time expired. They lost to the Giants on a last second play, or they beat the Giants, excuse me, on a last second play. Yeah. They had a come from behind victory late in the fourth quarter against the Atlanta Falcons, won that game by four points. To be this fair, though, team could, and then they beat Tampa Bay by one point after Tom Brady oh, that's a good seemed point. to have forgotten what down it was. Oh, I forgot. That was the Bears, yeah. This team could easily have lost those all four of those games. And this team could easily be one and nine right now. Yeah, I think that game against the Giants, I think that was the game where Daniel Jones went for a pass late in the quarter, like a two point conversion or something, and he missed it. I believe so. But like none of these Bears wins, the Bears' biggest win this season has been, let's see here, seven points. And that was against the Carolina Panthers when Teddy Bridgewater threw two interceptions. Yeah. Otherwise, one point, four points, four points, four points. This I understand Chicago's got a great defense, and their defense has their proved offense it. Their offense is horrendous. It, this offense is hurting the Bears. Sorry, but Allen Robinson and Jimmy Graham can't do it themselves. They need someone to throw the ball to them. It's pretty tough for those guys. But anyways, I just wanted to make sure we talk. <laughs> as 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 Wisconsin people and big uh, myself, big Packers fan, and I know a buddy of mine, big Bears fan, we can't forget about that game (laughs) well and you know it's a good thing you brought that up because that actually kind of segues into our next topic so we're actually going to completely do a full switch from sports here um we're gonna actually we're gonna go over and start our basketball conversation uh we gotta we gotta talk about the Milwaukee Bucks what's going on here man what's going on what what do you is the honest resigning I hope I I, we're, we're both we're Wisconsin boys so you know we're we're hope we're doing everything we can hoping on a thread that Giannis signs at Supermax I've been scared honestly yeah um, i don't know where Giannis's head is at i it's in greece tell you that much <laughs> <laughs> i well, where else i don't know ever since we lost to miami i've been but wondering if he's makes, gonna leave the thing that makes me wonder is like i get it we lost to miami but it's almost kind of a good thing that we lost to miami because miami made it to the nba finals so that the fact true. that we lost to the miami heat doesn't mean the bucks are bad by any nope. means it just means the heat are better but again, I will say they were the better Heat at also, that time. The Milwaukee, Heat also lost the finals. <laughs> Milwaukee didn't seem to show up at all in the bubble. No. Uh, that was not the same Milwaukee team we have no. watched earlier in the year. Mm-mm. But I, I will say, with the moves that the Bucks have made, I am not mad. No, uh, I think the biggest thing for me is I'm most happy that that Kings Bucks trade did not go through. Yeah, that's um, that's huge. You know, at work, like how high I am on Dante Divincenzo, yep. and to see him come back to Mo, I pray the Bucks do not find another trade for him. Um, better I, under- not. <laughs> I understand that you know the trade falling apart, him coming back might be like, oh, why would I want to play for a team that doesn't seem to want me? But yeah, he, he seems... means he means so much to this team. Yep. He's got so much potential. I I don't see why you would trade a guy like him. No. And he seems to care about Bucks fans too. He even said um, on Twitter, he said that he loves the Bucks fans, and Pat Connaughton even retweeted that and said that he does as well. So you got guys who want to play for the team, let them play. And those two guys, especially Pat Connaughton and Divincenzo, big hustle players, oh, big yes. hustle players. And you need, you just you need to have hustle on the basketball court because you. I'm sorry, but Brooke Lopez ain't doing the rebounding opportunities that we need. So Pat Connaughton's been doing really good at that, yeah. and I really appreciate that. Pat Connaughton, you're a beast. But you know, even like the DJ Augustine signing, you get a veteran point guard yeah. who he he can go out there and get you a bucket. He can yeah. go out there and distribute oh, yeah. the ball. I haven't watched a lot of Tory Craig though. Tory Craig, I'm very happy about. Um, 
I so I got into Tory Craig when I was playing 2K actually. Um, and not only that, watching the Nuggets in the bubble, Tory Craig is an elite defender. Um, I don't know who the coach is for the Nuggets. I forget who it is, but whoever their coach is, he had this mindset that Tory Craig was such a good defender that he was throwing Tory Craig on elite wing guys. So is like, it Mike, is it Mike Malone? I think it's Mike Malone. Yeah, Mike yeah. Malone. yep. So Mike Malone, he Mike Malone is very smart coach, by the way. He um he was having Tory Craig guard these elite wing guys. It's like if you're gonna have Tory Craig guard these elite wings, the Bucks need that big time. Yep. Because <laughs> their defense has been a little bit lackluster, and I'm not. I mean, you do have DPOY on the team. Don't get me wrong, but the DPOY can't do it all himself. Yeah, exactly. So. I mean, they did get a big pickup in a uh, great defender in Drew Holiday. Yep. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I remember Drew Holiday going all the way back to his 76ers days. I yep. was stunned when Philly traded him. Yeah. Uh, but do you think we gave up too much? For Drew Holiday? No, I don't. No. No. I The the reason I don't think we gave up too much is because we got rid of Eric Bledsoe, and that's all that matters. Um, Eric Bledsoe. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I sent out a – I posted on Facebook that I was so upset with the way that three years in a row – he underperformed in the playoffs. Yep. I he is he Eric don't get me wrong, Eric Bledsoe, great <laughs> basketball player. Great guy, he, good guy. <laughs> he first team all defense. Was yeah. it two years in a row or did he win second team this year? I think this year might have been second team. He's an all defensive player. Yeah. He he can go out there and guard the the best point guards. It's just on that offensive end he seemed to miss i understand they Diminish. were missing it. yeah he was he just vanished and it was hard like, it was hard to watch it Casper was Casper the friendly ghost type as a vanish. milwaukee bucks fan it was hard to watch three years in a row you know what that reminds vanished. me of? eric, eric bledsoe's offensive bubble performance you know what that reminds me of what's that my least favorite about uh, milwaukee buck of all time mirza Tladovich. um absolute dog <laughs> terrible not not dog in a good way like dog in a bad way not good no we're going to talk about past uh, shout out to Michael Red, my favorite at Milwaukee Michael Buck. Yep. I don't know the draft moves they made too. I I really I like Jordan Ora. He signed his two year deal yesterday, so I think Jordan Ora is going to be a very nice pickup for the Bucks. Uh, hopefully, he's good. And that that uh that guard that they got with the 60th pick, Sam Merrill, I think is his name. Um, he's pretty impressive too. I mean, I saw a uh, last minute buzzer beater three pointer that he made when he was playing in college. So, I will say I'm not. Uh, very familiar with those guys. I'm gonna, you know, I'm not very become... familiar with them either. I've just I've seen a I've seen a few highlights of Nora. Looks like a nice uh, inside defender, nice speedy guy. Can dunk the ball, can shoot the ball. Yeah, Played before, in a good program of Louisville. Before we picked up um, DJ Augustine, I was really hoping that the Bucks would draft uh, Cassius Winston. Yeah, um, him being you know one of the better. One of the best floor generals in the draft. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we see all, we saw what happened with when we took Malcolm Brogdon in the second round. I thought he would have been a great pickup for Milwaukee. Obviously, we didn't get him, but I would have been cool if the Bucks even grabbed Marcus Howard uh, as an undrafted free agent. But unfortunately, the Nuggets got there before the Bucks did. <laughs> Should we talk about the uh, team above them? The team that won the NBA championship this last year, and yeah, all of the about repackaging his, that they've done. LeBron and his homies. Um, biggest news of the Lakers: uh, Anthony Davis still hasn't signed his contract. Uh, there was multiple reports saying that he's holding out, waiting for Giannis to sign, because that way they can reshape their team based on how Giannis signs his contract. Or if he doesn't, um, I don't think there's a chance that he leaves the. <laughs> yeah, Los Angeles Lakers. So anybody that thinks because he hasn't signed his contract, well, he's going to sign back. But I think what he the only reason he's not is because he's waiting to re-sign to see what sort of contract he's going to have to sign. Because LeBron re- LeBron signed a contract like that with the Lakers, very similar to where it would benefit the team, but also benefit him. So that's the kind of thing that Anthony Davis is looking out for. What do you think about their signings that they've made so far? And they snagged away a former buck in Wesley Matthews. Wesley Matthews, Dennis Schroeder, Montrez Harrell, Mark Gasol. Brought back Contavious Caldwell-Pope. The fact that they were able to grab a guy who was already committed to not playing in the NBA this year, going to Spain and playing basketball, and bring him back to the NBA because they won a ring last year, and his brother played on the Lakers. 
That's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. But Marcus Gasol, I he's not lost the step yet. So it's that's going to be he finds his way into the starting rotation. Starting rotation, yeah, probably I could see it because uh, I saw news reports again saying that um, they were looking at Anthony Davis moving back to playing full time four. So LeBron would be back at the three. So probably be running some sort of lineup with um, what do they even got for a point guard out there now? Is it still uh, is it going to be Schroeder this year? Probably starting the point unless they run. Um, LeBron will probably be the main point guard yeah, again. They could do that too. Yeah, depending how how they run it, and if they end up keeping Kuzma and whatever goes on with that, it's going to be interesting. So the one thing I want to know with all, because this is a fast off season for the NBA, very quick. So far, there's been a lot of changes. What has been probably your biggest surprise this off season? My biggest surprise, um, I mean, I could go with the obvious one and say Gordon Hayward getting a bag from Charlotte. <laughs> that's that's the, that's the obvious one. I but never I, thought that Gordon Hayward was going to make forty million a year ooh, after dog. declining his option. I, Congratulations to Gordon Hayward yeah, for right. <laughs> finding that money and the Hornets for paying him. My biggest surprise would have to be Taco Fall signing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, my biggest surprise, I'd say, is uh, DeMarcus Cousins signing with the Rockets. Um, I never thought that I would see an actual center going to the Rockets because um, the Rockets played small ball last year all year. They stuck with P.J. Tucker. They had Tyson Chandler on their roster, refused to start him, but played P.J. Tucker at center. So the fact that they went out and got DeMarcus Cousins is kind of insane. And if they somehow do move Russell Westbrook and they have someone else paired up with Harden and then DeMarcus Cousins. Didn't they sign Christian Wood too? Yep, they also have Christian so Wood. They have so they're definitely man. they're definitely running a big man lineup this year, which is it's gonna be it's gonna be weird. Weird weird rocket team. But I guess with Dan Tony not in there anymore, he they're like, I well. think that is probably one of the most things I'm surprised about. Is Mike D'Antoni going from being the head coach of a playoff basketball team to being an, to being assistant. an assistant coach behind Steve Nash, yeah. who was in his first year? That team, the Nets team, is going to be very, very intriguing to watch, to say the least. Steve Nash, Amari Stoudemire, and Mike D'Antoni on uh, coaching staff um, with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving as your number one and two players. Whew. <laughs> That'll be... <laughs> And they still got some firepower on this team. They br- I'm pretty sure they brought back Joe Harris. Yep, they signed him. They have Jared Allen, and I'm pretty sure they're probably if it, they they still have Spencer Dinwiddie. And if they have to re-sign him, I'm not sure if they do, but they have DeAndre Jordan. So they so got a squad. From the, going from your biggest surprise move, what is your favorite and least favorite moves of this offseason? My favorite move is Chris Paul going to the Suns. Uh, as you guys also know, I'm a huge Chris Paul fan. So anything that benefits Chris Paul makes me happy because uh, I want to see him succeed. And I think him on the Suns with someone like Devin Booker is going to be awesome. Devin Booker, Aiton, um, Bridges, Jalen Smith got drafted there this year. So that's going to be awesome to see. What about the worst move? The worst move? Um, man, that's hard. There's been a lot of really bad moves, so it's kind of hard for me to tell what the worst <laughs> move would be. Um Again, the piss there. What is it? The Pistons and all the big men that yeah, they signed. Yeah, the Pistons signed Jaleel Okafor and Plumlee. Uh, um, Obviously, the not not Gordon Hayward being the worst move, but the Hornets for giving him all that yeah. money. Yeah. Well, and then the Raptors gave a bag to Aaron Baines. I don't understand what the whole thing with that was. That doesn't make much sense to me. And also, um, not that Rondo is a bad player. We saw how good of a player that, he yeah, is. Yeah, I'd say that, in my opinion, that's my worst offseason move. Why did the Hawks sign Chris Dunn and Rondo when they have Trey Young? I do, that doesn't make sense to me. Leadership. I Yeah, well, they did it with Vince Carter. Might as well find someone else to ruin their career. <laughs> I mean, he can – Rondo can go out there and he can be a big mentor, I think, to Trey Young. I think Rondo just said, you know what, I got another ring. He's like, you know, I'll just do whatever I got to do. <laughs> they, the Hawks had a lot of money to throw around this year. Yep. A lot, a lot of young pieces on that team. How about you, though? What would you take out of your favorite and worst or, or worst offseason move? I have two favorites. Obviously, I said my one earlier with the Bucks, um Kings trade falling through. Uh, I'm so happy that Dante is still on the team. I also a, a very – underrated move was the Warriors going out and acquiring Kelly Oubre. Yeah. Um, you know, with the devastating news of Clay Thompson missing yet another season, um, they needed another piece. 
and Kelly Oubre is still young enough. He played fantastic with the Suns last year. To see him get moved, what was it, twice this yeah. off season? He, I think he found a really good home because if now if you look at it, you got Steph Curry. Wiggins. I don't know who's going to play the two. I'm guessing Wiggins. It's probably going to be Wiggins, yeah. Kelly Oubre, Draymond Green, and then you got the rookie, James Wiseman, the mm-hmm. number two overall pick. And you still have guys like Kevon Moody coming off the bench. So That's still a great, great possible. Squad. I mean, I understand that it's not going to be the same Warriors team that we were accustomed to seeing in the past couple of years. But, I think but who this... knows how good Kelly Oubre can turn out to be this year. I have high hopes. Yeah. He could be he could be what uh what they needed. He could be the piece that they were looking for. Are you ready for the start of college basketball? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really not really too sure what I've got for college basketball this year. Um I mean, I'm going to root for Wisconsin as I do every year. Uh hope that you know, the guys like Davison and Reavers can really make that team good and everyone else on that team can perform. Don't forget about uh Michael Potter. Yep. I hope he. I think he's going to be in the starting lineup now. Him. I think should be. That should have been how the Badgers have played it earlier in the year instead of waiting to put Micah Potter in the starting lineup. Because I understand him and Nate Reavers are. They're tall. They're big right. men. Yep. Badgers were seemed a little bit nervous to put them both on the floor together, but when yeah. they did, they played amazing. Oh yeah. I mean, Micah Potter, I think, has the capability of being a big leader on this team this year. It's like running Nigel Hayes and Frank Kaminsky together. It turned out well. Yeah. Um, but so we've got here, is their number seven ranking too high for the Badgers? Um, I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. They haven't really kept up on it much. I, mean, they returned, uh, I don't know. They returned basically every player that was on the team that played significant minutes last year. Yeah. They, they were hot to end the season. See, the Badgers are always good in college, but then they get to the NBA or not in the NBA. Then they get out of school, and it's like, well, now what? <laughs> That's true, but this this is always a team that I love to watch year yeah. in and year out. I understand the past few couple seasons after the Kaminsky era um, were a little lackluster, but I don't know. I think this team could be for real. Um, the one thing that I lean back on is – before the season got canceled last year, I remember reading something on ESPN, and ESPN had predicted that the Badgers were going to be the national champions. And that speaks how highly people think of this team. I understand, you know, coming in at the start of the season, being number seven isn't meaning like, oh, you're one of the top five That's still teams. still pretty high honors, for the Badgers. That is a high ranking for a team that – at the start of last or midway through the season last year, it seemed like they were in some trouble. But I don't know; they're still the top team in Wisconsin, in my opinion. And then, I mean, with Marquette, um, without Marcus Howard, I'm going to be honest; I don't think they're going to be very good. Um, I think Marcus Howard was a really big reason why the team succeeded. Uh, and then with the Hauser brothers transferring as well, um, <laughs> I don't even know who's on the team. Really, I don't. I have no idea. Um, I'm not a big follower of Marquette basketball. Um, I will, I, every year I will pick the Badgers over the Golden Eagles, but right. I mean, they're still a Wisconsin team. If they would make, you know, to the tournament, I would. Yeah, UW Milwaukee, UW Green Bay can make yeah, it to the I, tournament as well. I, will, you know, I, I, I follow, uh, not closely, but, yeah. you know, I watch and see how those kind of teams like Green Bay and Milwaukee are doing, yep. per, hoping that they can, you know, win the Horizon League. Yeah. Um. I don't know about Mar- Marquette this year, though. Yeah, I yeah, that's going to be a tough one. But yeah, I don't know. I I think, honestly, I, for what we got here, um, I don't know. I think that can pretty much honestly conclude this week's episode of the podcast. I think we've kind of got through everything we're looking at getting to. Um, and uh, granted, this is just our first run through of this. I'm sure this will be a different lot next time we do it. But um, – Big week of sports. Big, yeah. There's lots to talk about. Lots of stuff happened. Um, we're gonna be doing another one of these. I don't know when did we say next week Tuesday again? Or are we doing it before? We can do it either one. Probably, probably do Tuesday next week. Yeah. So we'll probably do it Tuesday again next week. So, uh, and we might even throw in a weekend episode. We'll see what happens. How schedules are working. Mm-hmm. So based on how that is, uh, this looks like we're gonna end it off on this today. Um. Oh, also, did you see the college football rankings came out? I did not. Um, 
They ended up coming out with the the first college football rankings of the season. Um, looks like Alabama is number one, followed by Notre Dame at two. Clemson comes in at three, Ohio State four, and then Texas A&M is that first team out. Northwestern had a big jump, I think, that yep. went against the Badgers and holding yeah, that Badgers team to seven fell. points. They've jumped all the way up to number eight. Uh, the I think a surprise team so far this year to me has been the Cincinnati Bearcats. They come in at seven. Yeah. And it, this I understand there's a lot of hype with the what you know, you got Bama, Clemson, Ohio State are in there every single year. Yep. Um what don't be surprised I mean, you have three SEC teams right now in the top six. Yeah. Texas A and M and then Florida is at number six. Mm-hmm. But the biggest disappointment to me, I want to say this before we go in college football, the Penn State Nittany Lions. Yeah. They're not even on five. Yeah. Started the season inside the top ten. They've lost five straight. I believe they lost this last Saturday. I don't know what's going on with that team, but I don't know. I just felt like we shouldn't. I, that was just breaking news that I saw on my phone here. So so I'm reading this here, and it says uh, Ohio State is a Big Ten's highest-ranked team in the CFP rankings, followed by Northwestern, which is 5-0 and and likely set to face the Buckeyes in the Big Ten championship game. Wisconsin, by the way, um, no long, so Northwestern's path to the Big Ten championship game just got a whole lot easier um, about an hour ago as it was reported that the Wisconsin-Minnesota game for this Saturday has been canceled um, with positive COVID tests for the uh, Minnesota Golden Gophers. So that will take the Badgers' chances of redemption of making the Big Ten championship game um, vanishing. Not eligible to play in the championship game. Mandated that team must put, uh, compete in at least six games to play in the title game this season. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, this whole COVID thing is kind of stupid. It sucks. It it sucks. It's um, it almost makes you wonder. Even if the Badgers won against Northwestern, would they still even they still wouldn't even be able to have competed for the Big Ten championship game? Nope. If they would, they would be three and zero right now, yep. and they would their chances of playing against most likely Ohio State for the Big Ten championship would be they they wouldn't be able to play. Yeah, I mean it sucks. I mean that they have Nebraska and Purdue that were called off. So I mean it sucks that you know the team had so many positive COVID tests the week after the first game, and then was forced to cancel the two weeks. Which I I, I don't agree with the Big Ten mandating the twenty one day ban or no. twenty one day quarantine. Nope. Um, I feel like that was just the Big Ten's way of saying you guys wanted to play football. Mm-hmm. Anybody test positive, this is what's going to happen, and you know that it screwed over one team right now in the Big Ten. Well, and it's you know it's not even the fact that it, it ends the Wisconsin Badgers' chance for the Big Ten championship. It's also the the Wisconsin Minnesota rivalry that's just yep. gone down the drain now. Uh, they played 113 consecutive years from 1907 to 2019. And and I don't even think the Badgers can make a bowl game either if i'm probably not correct. if they can't if they can't make the championship game with only winning five games probably not i don't know how that's gonna work there's always next year yep <laughs> see how covid goes next year oh and uh ironically um before we before we cut loose here i'm i just scrolled upon this apparently bam out bio actually signed his extension today five-year extension 195 million um that's actually a very good sign for Giannis because if the Heat were one team that um he was being that linked to Giannis was being linked to signing with and Giannis or not Giannis Bam and Anthony Davis are two people that were sitting out their contracts. So um I guess we'll just have to see. I think us Bucks fans will be happy when we hear something from Giannis. When we see that break that post about um Giannis I mean, he does have until the 21st to sign that super max this offseason. Yeah, season. I mean, so did Bam, but Bam signed his. If he do, if he doesn't sign it by then, Milwaukee fans, I'd be a touch nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Someone just shared a thing on Twitter. Um, 
Watch live now. Giannis signs his contract extension and speaks to the media from 2016. So, um, yeah, that was unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, it's official. The Bucks have all, uh, officially signed Sam Merrill to the roster as well. So, Nora and Sam Merrill are both officially Bucks. And we are both officially ending this podcast for the night. Thank you, everybody, for coming on, watching, or listening to this. Um, as you know, you're listening to this on either iTunes, YouTube, or SoundCloud. Uh, again, thank you, Austin, for being here with me. This has yeah, been, thank you for having me. Been a great opportunity for this, and we will be back with you either on the weekend or next week. Thank you guys for watching. I keep saying watching. Thank you guys for listening to uh, Three Sport Podcast. Have a great night and have a happy holidays. Thanksgiving. <laughs>